Today we're going to talk about one of my favorite mismanagement stories regarding birds and salmon and steelhead smolts on the Columbia River. Now this has got to be one of the worst examples of fish and wildlife management I've ever seen. And surprise, surprise, uh, U.S. Army Corps is of course to blame for most of this. If you haven't seen my other video with what's going on with Willamette Reservoirs, um, you can check that out uh, up here. Okay, so let's talk about angry birds. Uh, I actually like birds. I got into fishing when I was quite young and I've been a bird watcher ever since I was about 10 years old. And the two birds we're gonna be talking about today uh, are double-crested cormorants and Caspian terns. Now, cormorants are a species that a lot of anglers are familiar with and are not particularly fond of. They're a fairly large uh, goose-sized bird that specialize in eating uh, all kinds of aquatic creatures. They're pretty much generalists. They'll eat salmon, steelhead, smolts, squid, herring, sardines, whatever they can get uh, their beaks on. But they're very voracious and effective uh, predators. And then there's the other species, which uh, a lot of anglers uh, are probably familiar with in terms of they've probably seen them. They're called Caspian terns. They're a large uh, gull-like bird. They have a big honk and orange beak, and they have a very distinct voice. If you've ever been out fishing on the Columbia in the estuary or even upriver or on Potholes Reservoir, um, you've heard them. They have a very distinctive call. It's like very distinct. Like you, you can hear them coming from a long way away, and they have very deep, powerful uh, wing beats and flight. So I think they're a really cool bird, but they are very much a specialist on, on feeding on fish. Uh, particularly, they have a great affinity for salmon and steelhead smolts. Well, steelhead smolts more than anything because they uh, tend to travel nearer the surface than salmon smolts do. So this story really starts on East Sand Island. Now, East Sand Island is an island in the Columbia River estuary um, across from the city of Astoria. It's a dredging island, um, so the Army Corps dredges the Columbia River to keep commercial traffic moving all the way up to the port of Portland and beyond. So they created this island. It's about 62 acres in size. I have a bunch of notes here I might be referencing. Um, and around 1984, the first Caspian terns showed up here. And this colony quickly grew to be one of the largest Caspian tern colonies in the world. There was at one point estimated to be around 8,300 pairs. That's a lot. That's a lot of Caspian terns. Um, and it really represented the bulk of the entire West Coast population, Pacific Flyway population of Caspian terns. So there was a lot of concerns about the impacts that these terns were having on salmon, steelhead, smolt populations as they outmigrated uh, through the Columbia River estuary. There was, you know, there's millions and millions and millions of smolts passing through uh, the Columbia River estuary on their way out to sea um, as they outmigrate as smolts. So there was some hazing done early on to move these birds uh, away from the Columbia River estuary, but what actually happened is those birds just abandoned East Sand Island and moved upstream above the Astoria Megler Bridge to an island, another dredging island called Rice Island. Now the problem is, is that birds, um, you know, they're very opportunistic. They're gonna feed on, when they're feeding their babies and, and around their nesting islands, they're gonna travel the shortest distance to feed. So by going upstream, their diet became even more focused on uh, feeding on salmon and steelhead smolts. Whereas when they were downstream, closer to the mouth of the river at uh, East Sand Island, they were you know, incorporating things like sardines and anchovies and herring into their diet. And so it wasn't as, uh, their diet wasn't as salmon steelhead dependent. So the decision was made to move those birds through hazing back to East Sand Island. Now, simultaneously, uh, double-crested cormorants also colonized East Sand Island in the 80s, uh, shortly after Caspian terns showed up there, and their population also quickly exploded to become the largest double-crested cormorant colony on the West Coast. 
It was estimated at one time that there were over 30,000 birds nesting on there, so about 15,000 pairs of double-crested cormorants. And the number of smolts that these cormorants were consuming, this one colony of cormorants, was pretty staggering. Um, they were eating somewhere between 7 and 12% of all the salmon and steelhead smolts exiting the Columbia River, which is something like 20 million plus smolts a year. So in 2015, it was decided by the U.S. Army Corps against a lot of uh, opinion. Um, there was a lot of folks not happy with this decision. They were going to drive the cormorants and Caspian terns off of East Sand Island once again. Now remember, they've already had problems doing this with Caspian terns, uh, but it was decided that this was the best way to... Uh, address this issue. They were proposing to shoot up to 11,000 cormorants shotguns and destroy up to 26,000 nests over a four-year period. Um, they destroy the nests by oil dipping the eggs or shaking them so that they don't hatch. The idea was to drive the cormorant population down. So in 2016 they initiated this program and in a very short order, when they sent folks out there with guns <laughs> to shoot at these cormorants, uh, the entire colony collapsed. I mean, seabirds aren't stupid, right? Like, you're not going to nest in a place that you don't feel safe. So those birds just quickly said, you know what? I mean, they're long-lived birds. They don't have to nest every year. They were like, you know what? We're not going to stick it out here. We're just going to leave. They had done some work, like, preparing potential nest sites for alternative nesting sites for Caspian terns elsewhere on the Oregon and Washington coast, and there were also some inland colonies of Caspian terns that they expected to see numbers bolst bolstered. Um, and that did happen. The Caspian terns did spread out, um, although a small contingent of Caspian tern pairs remained somewhere around 1,500 pairs remained on East Sand Island. But the cormorants pretty much just up and left entirely. And what happened is there really wasn't a great alternative nesting site like prepped for all these cormorants to go to. They kind of expected some of them to go to San Francisco and other estuaries. So what happened is uh, about 10,000 of those cormorants uh, just moved up to nest on the Astoria Megler Bridge. So there had been, for a while, small numbers of cormorants nesting on that bridge. Um, but, you know, cormorants are smart. Um, everybody likes to think of these animals as dumb, but they're very smart. They understand distribution of food resources and the, the value of finding safe nesting sites. And that bridge provided great, easy access to a very productive fishing ground and it's safe. There's not much predator activity out there. Uh, so what happened is now for several years, there's been 10,000 plus cormorants nesting on the Astoria Megler Bridge. And uh, remember when I talked about when the Caspian terns moved upstream and it was a problem because they were eating more salmon steelhead smolts? Surprise, surprise. Uh, all these cormorants are now further upstream than where they were at East Sand Island are now causing more problems than and eating more salmon and steelhead smolts than they would have been down at East Sand Island where they could you know take advantage of eating things like sardines and anchovies and such which were more common further down in the estuary. So they literally just made the exact same mistake they had done before and now you have all of these birds building nests all over the Astoria Bridge, which is a huge, you know, miles long bridge over the Columbia River that takes a lot of maintenance. And all of the guano uh, from their poop is very acidic. It builds up on the bridge. It damages the bridge. It damages the, the it reduces the lifespan of the paint on that bridge. Also, the nests are really just gross because they're just like, you know, they throw up their food. They feed their babies. There's uh, fish pieces in there and maggots and poop and um, it makes it very difficult to clean the bridge and to prep it for painting. It also makes it very challenging to inspect the bridge and then there I guess when all of these cormorants are fledging um, you're having all of these baby cormorants trying to take their first flight and they're falling onto the roadway and there's like 10 plus birds getting smashed every day on the bridge which isn't isn't good like we don't want people driving over birds like all the time that's not how 
this works. So after several years, here we are back to square one. The new decision that's coming out by Army Corps, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, everybody, is to move the birds back <laughs> to East Sand Island. Um, I mean, what an absolute debacle. If this is going to cost them, they're estimating upwards of $18 million over the next four years with appropriations of up to another half a million approximately every year after until they can get these birds to move back to East Sand Island. So in order to try and lure these birds back to East Sand Island, uh, they're going to build false nests, um, like put tires out and put sticks in them so it looks like nests, and put up dummy cormorants and play cormorant calls. And they're going to simultaneously and non-lethally haze the birds on the bridge by shooting firecrackers and water cannons at them and try and get them to move back downstream to where they originally were. So what an absolute disaster and waste of time and money. Uh, just, you just can't, as somebody who works in conservation biology and I, I followed this story and I, there was such uh, uproar against it. So many people opposed this plan from the get go. Uh, it's just absolutely drives me bonkers to see this kind of implementation of wildlife management. Uh, simultaneously, I really want to circle back to Caspian terns for a couple reasons. Some of those birds, those Caspian terns, did go inland and bolstered a population of Caspian terns that nest on Potholes Reservoir, which isn't very far from where I live today. And even though that's just a small colony of like 300 pairs, so 600 birds or so, those birds are traveling, you know, 15 miles every day from that reservoir over to the upper Columbia to feed primarily on steelhead smolts as they migrate down the Columbia River. And those that small, tiny population is having a bigger impact than that giant population originally did on East Sand Island. Um, they are eating somewhere between 12 and 20 percent of all upper Columbia River steelhead smolts. Every day they're making that journey back and forth from Paul's Reservoir over to the river and back. And there are some estimates using pit tagging because they can pit, pit tag the steelhead smolts and then they go out to the nests and they can find all these pit tags that the babies get fed and they poop them out. And they are estimate that they could be eating upwards of 10% of endangered steelhead runs altogether in the upper Columbia River. So it's really interesting to me that they chose to tackle this large colony down at the mouth of the river, but ignored the smaller colony that was having a proportionally greater impact. And they probably helped bolster that population because they had color banned those Caspian terns from East Sand Island, and they saw some of those birds showing up at various colonies elsewhere. And of course, I think now the real tragedy is, is that um, that East Sand Island, which population of Caspian terns, which was once the largest, um, you know, it's just been a few thousand birds or less. Uh, after the hazing incident and the colony reduction in size, the those that colony became like targeted by because uh, it was smaller and easier, I guess, to pick apart. It got targeted by bald eagles, which were you know rebounding really strongly in the late '90s and early 2000s. And they essentially have had no successful nesting on that island. And now we have a highly pathogenic avian influenza, which is really smashing through our gull, geese, and tern populations, and also destroying our, ch our chicken, our large chicken poultry industry. And what we're seeing is uh, there's just this massive decline in. Caspian tern populations along the entire Pacific Flyway, and you know potentially upwards of a 50% decline over the past decade. And again, this is the problem, like when you're managing wildlife, you cannot anticipate what other types of stochastic, these large unpredictable events, like an outbreak of a disease, what, what kind of repercussions they're gonna have further down the line. And I think one of the things that we don't wanna see is, you know, is managing a species to a uh, threatened or extinction <laughs> potential is not a good thing. We don't want to create another endangered species, right? And I feel like what we're doing 
how we're managing this, these Caspian terns, I feel as we have a real potential here to really drive the species to the point that we'll actually be working to bring it back. So it's a cautionary tale. I mean, this one's really frustrating for me uh, as someone who is both an outdoorsman and respects the value of our fisheries, but also respects the value of non-game wildlife like birds. Um, you know, you really need to think about the consequences and plan accordingly if you're going to start tinkering with the system like this, especially a really large system like the Columbia River Estuary and one of the largest bird colonies in the world. But here we are, we're going to be spending, you know, 20 million bucks to basically undo what we did. And also at the same time, threatening the viability of Caspian terns in the Pacific Flyway. Anyways, absolutely crazy. Love to hear your thoughts below. I'll see you next time. Just remember, fish smarter, not harder.